Great opportunity today, uh, a late add to the agenda, but one that I think is, uh, is worthwhile. Uh, we're pleased to present a fascinating look into the world of electronic warfare. We have one of the Air Force's premier combat-tested leaders here to provide his insights on the mission of equipping U.S. joint and coalition forces with timely, targeted, tailored EW threat change detection, intelligence mission data support, mission planning tools, and live virtual and constructive training support. Our speaker this afternoon is Lieutenant Colonel William H. O'Brien IV, commander of the 453rd Electronic Warfare Squadron at JBSA Lackland. His unit is responsible for providing electronic warfare support to the combat air forces, joint and allied war fighters, planners, and DOD leaders. He also leads the next generation of EW analysis, data production, threat detection, and modeling generation of EW threats for combat exercises and planning. Lieutenant Colonel O'Brien is a graduate of the Air Force Weapons School and has led units to combat as the squadron and wing weapons officer. A senior navigator, he has over 2,500 hours in a wide variety of aircraft, including the B-1, E-8, RC-135, F-15, and F-16. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel O'Brien. Thanks. If I'm working back, yeah, looks like I'm working. A little bit of feedback. All right, the small audience here, so anybody, everybody familiar with EW? Who's not familiar with EW? So I know there's a lot of cyber going on out here, so we'll try to talk to this. Um, got a disclaimer statement on here, though, so there's some stuff that we'll probably talk about that I don't get to talk for the U.S. Air Force totally. Um, so all the opinions are here. Some of them are just opinions, so I'm not going to speak for any of them. So why? Why do we do what we do at the 453rd Electronic Warfare Squadron? Why do we do what we do for electronic warfare? And why do we do what we do for electronic warfare integrated reprogramming? and it's for that battlefield right there. Very complicated um, battlefield. So our aircraft are getting a lot smarter. Uh, fusion is the way to go, um, and fusion is what we're in right now. And how do we fuse all that together? How do we integrate together? So we have to not only ID the good guys, we gotta ID the neutral people, and we gotta ID the bad guys. So in our priority order, don't shoot down the good people shoot what's trying to shoot me and then hit the target. The only thing we always hear is hit the target because that's our number one priority, but there's others too that come before that. And so how do you do all that? How do you do all that with a lot less resources than we used to have? The Air Force is at its smallest than it's ever been right now. And so we kind of do that with some material and human education uh, in that. So I'm the commander of the 453rd Electronic Warfare Squadron. What I'm going to do is kind of brief you up. I'm going to give you some, what's, what's fifth gen mean? Does everybody understand what fifth gen generation aircraft means? I'll kind of give you some background on that because that means a lot to what we do and how we're changing uh, with how we support data into electronic warfare integrated reprogramming. I'll get into what mission data is. I'll give you a little bit of background on what, if anybody have heard, has heard of IMD, which is intelligence mission data because that feeds the mission data which go into our aircraft, which make our aircraft pretty smart to go out and fight the good fight. And then that smart aircraft that we might see as building up, it's not the only aircraft out there because we're not fighting a aggregate fight, we're fighting a disaggregate fight. And so the way we have to integrate and then the way we bound the problem for integration so we can go out there and fight smartly. So I'm gonna kind of run through that and the way the 453rd fits into it. Okay, fifth generation aircraft. So first generation turbojet. That's the first time we looked at it. We get to third generation. We had some pretty smart, uh, we had some upgraded avionics there, and it's our first look at precision weapons, so our laser guided weapons uh, that we threw down with, there with our third generation aircraft. The, f uh, the fourth generation aircraft, that's what we're used to seeing, our F-16s, our F-15Es, our 15s, all that. They are still our mass numbers uh, that are there, and they're still heavy into our fight. They are still a tip of the end of the spear uh, with that. We looked at sophisticated avionics uh, with that. We got even more precise uh, with our weapons, especially GPS-aided uh, uh, type weapons. Maneuverability got better, and we had our first look into stealth with the one, uh, F-117. Then we get into our fifth generation. Really, the difference in fifth generation is that fused avionics, the avionics, the integration with all that thinking. It's a thinking aircraft that can put all that together. You need a lot of data to do that. So kind of backing up a little bit more and going, hey, what does fifth gen really mean uh, to the United States Air Force here? Stealth, maneuverability, multi-role, and few sensor avionics. Few sensor avionics is really what it's at. But it doesn't mean all those aircrafts do everything. The F-22 is really, really good at air-to-air, -air, 
and the F-35, about to be IOC here pretty soon, really, really good at air to ground. They can do a little bit of both of those, but each one has its forte in, in those. Okay, so what is the difference between that fourth gen and that fifth gen, breaking it down a little bit more, and then we can get into some of how we support that in data. So fourth gen, we got our pods, we got our radar, we got our human eyeballs, um, we got our jamming pods, so a couple of pods flying on our aircraft, and uh, the weapons uh, too. So the radar, the RWR, which is a radar warning receiver, that says, hey, what's going to shoot at me? What's looking at me? Going into that. The IFF, I'm going to identify you, whether you're a friend or foe. And the targeting pod, they all come up on separate displays. The pilot, or the WIZO, or a combination of those, is going to fuse all that together and make a decision on what that is. So it's not doing that for you. Um, the RWR does it a little bit. That's where integrated reprogramming is. But let me move to fifth gen. Take all those pods, all those things together, and I'm going to push it into one thing and make that aircraft fuse it all together for me and go, that's what that is based on all those sensors looking at it. Pretty incredible stuff. Now the pilot is freed up to actually make decisions on what I shoot first instead of what it is. Needs a lot of data to do that. So mission data. Here's the way we think of mission data. So it takes decades to do the hardware, right? So the F-35, how old is the F-35? 1990s technology. So pretty old. It takes decades to make that. When we get to the software, we call them uh, operational uh, flight programs. Uh, so the software that goes into that hardware, we can get that done in a few years. So we see OFPs. We call them get upgraded in those aircraft uh, every couple of years. And that's kind of like when you're looking at your iPhone. So the iPhone's nice and pretty. And then I get my, my software that goes on there, my I.O., whatever it is. They upgrade it with that. Okay, it doesn't really mean anything to me. It's not built to my needs, not the games I want to play, not the map data I want necessarily, not the apps I want to go travel with. So that stuff is our mission data, and that makes it unique to us in the fight we want to go fight. We can get that done pretty quickly in a couple of days if we have everything right for us. And so that's the way we like to think about that and what we think about the mission data and the way we build that. Okay, so the 453rd. We're at Lackland Air Force Base. And we sit on Security Hill uh, out there on the third floor. We're right next to the 688 Cyber Wing. There's a lot of crosstalk we do there. There's a lot of EW talk. Uh, there's some cyber talk in there because all that melds together when we're trying to possibly take down an enemy uh, uh, IAD, so uh, integrated air defense system. But we belong to Eglin Air Force Base, the 53rd Wing, and more specifically, the 53rd Electronic Warfare Group. They are the reprogramming center for the Air Force uh, for ACC. So there's a couple of squadrons uh, that break us down in the way we do stuff. So up on the top left-hand side is a 36 Electronic Warfare Squadron, and they do mission data for all our legacy aircraft, plus the F-22. Going right below them, the 16th Electronic Warfare Squadron does all the hardware. So they have all the pods. They have the line replaceable units in our bombers. So we get that mission data, we plug it into there, we got to make sure it works in the hardware. So those two teams work in that rather pretty tight. The one below them is the 513th. They do what the 36 above that does and the 16th does for the F-35. Um, everything. On the uh, top right-hand side is the 68th Electronic Warfare Squadron. They have a little bit of intel flavor. They work with uh, us pretty tight on that, the 453rd. But they also do all that for our uh, foreign material sales. So our, all our F-16s that everybody flies out there, we help them out with that. All our F-15s and F-15Es that we fly out there, we help all our partnering nations with that. Then you get to the 453rd. Uh, the 453rd is pretty much uh, the trigger or the intel function and analysis function that pumps all that data into those other squadrons, into the group who sets our priorities, that group commander. That's what the 453rd does, and I'll kind of break that down a little bit. The one right below them is the Partnering uh, Reprogramming Center, and that's what the 513th does to all our partners for the F-35, so they help them out. they got to work in conjunction with that pretty tightly. The Mission Data Circle of Life. So the AOR says what we need. Um, they're the ones who guide it. They are the warfighter. So that three-star, that four-star sitting out in the COCOM, they are the warfighter. And everybody who's flying those airplanes are the extension of their fingers to get that done uh, with our national objectives. Okay, then we got to, after we get that, we get what our requirements are. We go to acquire and 
get that data, that intelligence data. So we got to go find out what they need and put that together, package it up, and go, okay, this is what it looks like. This is what we're seeing new. Go sample that environment and then send that off to be programmed into mission data. So one by one, they kind of put that, they put that code into the mission data and they go look at it, what that matches up to a scenario. After they're done with that, they build and integrate that into a bigger mission data type tape that can now fit in our jet. So we go do that, make sure that all works together and nothing trumps anything else. And then they go verify and, uh, or validate that. Um, after that, they go release the mission data to the AOR and immediately we get feedback on that because nothing's ever perfect, right? Hence, all our computers are always being upgraded all the time because nothing, nothing's ever perfect. All we could work better. Uh, and the environment's always changing as well. Then the cycle starts all over again, and it never stops. Sometimes we have to get a little bit faster for it. Emergency reprogramming, that's what that's all about. So the 453rd. So we have to equip not only the U.S., but we're equipping our joint, our coalition, uh, and partners with timely, targeted, tailor uh, electronic warfare data. So the mission data that we need or the intelligence that we need. Uh, we get into that mission support, so we are a support to all that group. And then we also do electronic warfare tools. So we make an analysis tool that ends up in every one of our mission planning systems, including the Navy. So Air Force and Navy work uh, on that. So our algorithms that go do that are in those systems. So we help out with that. And then on top of that, we are, so we have this thing called LVC, which is a live virtual constructive. Everybody else sees that as simulator. We actually are the constructive IADs for virtual flags in the DMO, the Distributed Mission Operations. So we do that as well. So we build that whole entire IADs that we can go now interdict on uh, from a simulator side. And not only is it just our aircraft, but we can interdict cyber uh, into that too and see how that fits. So really working on true integration in the simulators and the LVC. Okay, so how do we fit into the Warfare Center? They, there's a saying out there that as the warfare center goes at Nellis Air Force Base, so goes the combat air force. And it's true because it's all the testing tactics and training that the warfare center has that belongs under the air combat command that goes drives the way we fight. So if you want integration to happen, you gotta call up the warfare center and ask them to work it out for you. So the 453rd all the way down to the bottom, looking at what's new out there in the environment. Um, and analyzing what's out there and feeding that forward into everything that we're testing. So we feed that forward to the EWG, the 53rd wing, who does operational testing, and then get out to the Warfare Center to get a beat. So it can be taught at the wep uh, weapons school, and it can be trained with the intel squadrons that are out there, and then everybody who comes to Red Flag and integrates. And so we got cyber, space, and the regular air. So we got all three of those domains that we use, the air, space, and cyber, that are working together at Red Flags, and the Warfare Center drives all that. Okay, breaking down the 453rd a little bit more. So on the top left-hand side, we call that, it's threat change detection, it was mentioned before. We call that flagging. We're just kind of raising our hands, go, this is different out there, and then we send that to the, um, the service production centers like NASIC and MISIC that go validate that and then send that forward. And so we're just kind of raising our hands out there, and we warn the EWG, hey, there might be something new out there, so they can get ready to program. And they can actually type everything in the keys, wait for that validation to come and hit enter and then it's ready to go out into the aircraft pretty fast. So that's how we kind of make that 24 to 72 hours work for us a little bit. So they need us to kind of look out there where the, the Sentinels, like I said on that mission slide, where the Sentinels kind of looking out there for anything different. On the right-hand side of that, that analysis thing that I talked about that goes in all our mission planning systems is called the integra uh, integrated many-on-many. -many. We call it IMOM. And I know our Intel folks are uh, used to seeing that. And those are the ones that kind of make those bug splats. And they are based on power, they takes in the environment, the bending of rays, all that kind of stuff. It is all put into those algorithms, and all, the algorithm's always developing. Um, and that goes into all our mission planning systems, and we use that to analyze our plans uh, that go forward. On the right-hand side of that, those two pictures look pretty similar. So the algorithm that says, hey, I can do this electronic warfare-wise, I can put that in the LVC and the constructive IADs, right? Because now I can possibly jam onto that IADs in a, a constructive way or a simulated to constructive way or a, a virtual to constructive way. And also I need to radiate out uh, that. And so if I can hide from it, terrain mask, all that kind of stuff, those same algorithms got to be put into the, uh, the, we call it dice to distributed integrated uh, constructive environment um, so we can do that. And it kind of belongs in the 453rd for that. 
So without, so that gets pretty complicated. We've got three kind of unique things going on in flagging. It is always being programmed. As soon as we find something new, now we've got to write a code for it, right? It says, don't go try to find that again because we already found it. And so it flags it as known now. So as soon as we find it, it's known. So it doesn't go into the new. If we didn't update that, it is constantly being updated. We'd be in a world of hurt because we do flagging, <laughs> a lot of flags. Um, so we have nine, you, actually, it's just showing 11 up there, but there's nine unique systems across three different domains. So cross-domain going on right there. Uh, Radiant Mercury is one of those big things we use, and it is a nightmare trying to keep up with these sometimes. So we have a whole support flight that just works on that, that keeps our systems going. And uh, let me tell you, there's only like 13 people in there, and they are resource limited. Um, and so that's what we work on there. The thumbs up is a kind of a heritage patch that we have. Uh, we go all the way back to World War II and a lot of that. And we used to be electronic warfare uh, school out in California uh, back not too many years ago. Okay, so the flagging mission. They, if you break it down, they're really taken. So on the left-hand side, you see a radar warning receiver. If we don't know what it is, it comes up as a U. It's up to the pilot to figure it out based on a lot of different things, sound, all that kind of good stuff. We try to find that, categorize it, put in the right thing. So on the right-hand side, it turns into something that we know because I can do something about that. Helps my decision-making process get a lot faster. So we look at that in areas of interest, and we look for the whole globe. So we use all the sensors that look at the whole globe, and uh, we got to do that in priority order because I think if we used every one of us in this whole entire building right now and we try to go look at the whole globe for everything's new, we're not going to, it's going to be pretty hard to find everything. And so we got to do that in some priority. The electronic warfare group commander does that for you, helps us set those priorities, and he is constantly talking out to the electronic warfare coordinators uh, out in the, all the air operation centers, which are joint, that bring that data in and say, hey, this is our number one priority. Uh, this is what we got to go look at. And so we go focus down in those areas and try to go look for what is new. Um, what we do, and so it's not only what is new compared to the electronic warfare integrated uh, reprogramming database that NASIC owns, but also we look at what is new compared to the models that are out there. So what are our aircraft see? Does it show up as new in our aircraft or can our aircraft figure it out by itself? And so we look at those models as well. We do that for AFSOC entirely. For the other stuff, we send it straight to Eglin because Eglin can just put it in the hardware right away. AFSOC works a little bit differently. So the Air Force Special Operations Command is also a, good, a, a primary customer of ours as, as well. And so our electronic warfare group commander talks to AFSOC a lot to try to pair those up because those priorities can go like this pretty darn quickly. And so we need to know who, what we got to go tackle first. The Army reprogramming uh, team, also ARAT, uh, also likes what we do. And so they are in on it too. <laughs> and I'll show you that in a little while there. So here's all our customers. On the right, on your left-hand side, upper uh, left-hand side, are our primary customers. So I mentioned that 36th Electronic Warfare Squadron and that uh, the 513th Electronic Warfare Squadron, they work directly for the Electronic Warfare Group Commander, primary customers. Right next to them, a uh, little bit to the, to the right, is AFSOC. Um, and so we, we help them out with all of that too. And then right below them is uh, the Army reprogramming team. So we also talk to our coalition partners uh, as well, and we help them out uh, when we can and when we can share that data. Uh, and the data that we give them is technical flagging reports. So what is different out there? We send that. We also send a hotspot report. So it might not be different, but it might be different in something went new somewhere. And so we just kind of warn them, hey, this, this moved into this country. Uh, go take a look at that. Um, and then a, uh, a delta report. So as those uh, technical flagging reports build up, right, um, it doesn't get updated in the mother database, right? The whole uh, database on a constant basis. And so there's many databases out there is we've got to keep a list of what we found new and we call that the delta. So there might be nine for like a week. And then when that gets upgraded in there, then it's no longer in the delta list. And so that's how we keep the whole team involved on what we do. So below there also FMS is a 68th. We help them out with that. And then on the right-hand side, our service, some of our service production centers and who we help out. And so uh, NASIC's in there, the NRO is in there. So we send all that new stuff to them too, just to keep them up on the loop of what information is there. On the right-hand side, those primary service production centers, NASIC, MISIC, uh, NSA, we gotta keep them uh, uh, in our OODA loop as well. 
Okay, break, break a little bit. So we also do electronic workflow tools, like I mentioned. And so the integrated many on many. And you can see that bug spot on the bottom left-hand corner. So we can take a whole IADS, take a look at that, and where we could, uh, where we could take care of uh, uh, any of the weaknesses out there. Um, and so it's a way for us to be, to get a prediction on what we go to mission plan on. Um, and maybe where, if we can't get in there with our aluminum assets or our flying assets, what other uh, domains can we rely on? Is there space effects? Is there cyber effects that can help us out and integrate? Is that a fire alarm? Attention, attention. An emergency has been reported in this building. That is awesome. Please cease operation. Did you like my cyber attack? <laughs> uh, I'll wait. If there's a fire behind me, just let me know. I will keep going this way. Um, there you go, exactly. I like that. I like that. <laughs> so our... <laughs> So our IMOM is actually a desktop application uh, as well. So that algorithm, we can actually go give that to the mission planners. They can go plan that on their laptop. In the category of uh, classification that it is, it just depends on the data that's in there. And so uh, I can have it unclassed data, have it on my unclassed laptop, and go plug and play away and see what I can do. So uh, we can have people practice on that. And uh, we send uh, teams to go out and uh, train everybody how to do that. In fact, we go to the weapons school and, um, and train them up on how to use IMOM and the applic applicability of it. Uh, as well. Acoustics are also in there as well. Uh, so when we go fly, sound is a big thing, especially with our small aircraft, and that means a lot to AFSOC. And so we go look at those acoustic models as well uh, there. Um, and we work with some of the other squadrons to give us that data to plug in there, because there's the data that we need for ourselves and our platforms. We should already have that. Plug that in. And there's data on the other side, too, that we've got to actually go find intelligence-wise and put that in there and marry the two up and see what our predictability is. The live virtual constructive, so we call that DICE, uh, like I said before, um, and that's the constructive IADS. And so we build that as well for all these virtual flags. We go out to exercises as well. So when we want to integrate cyber, the best way to do that is so to put that in a constructive way and make it very complicated that we've got to actually go in there and interdict uh, or go there and do intel uh, on that and break it down, feed it back, and then kind of break, and then go back there and interdict on it the way we think it operates. And so it gives us the ability to do that, and we can always change that up uh, as necessary. And so some good ways to do that. And we're kind of breaking down, uh, breaking ground with there. And we work with the wing that, you just, that we just saw up here a lot, and the 90, 90th iOS helps us do that. Okay, so as far as customers go, uh, there is a ton of customers. This is IMOM uh, that we go support, and not only for the Combat Air Force, but for the F-35 and Lightning, so their simulator uses our algorithms. Um, the Air Force Life Cycle Management and the, NR, the NRO, uh, you name it, we use it. And then we're, we also use, uh, there's joint, we're tied in a joint with, with weaponeering and electronic warfare weaponeering. Um, SAMS EASA, we are the RWR, the radar warning receiver, and re, that, that algorithm is that for MQ-9s and MQ-1s. And so we go support them with that. And that's just them looking at a laptop that goes, hey, okay, this is what can see me. This is what can't see me. I can go here. I can go here. I can hear them here. I can see them here. So pretty good stuff. Same kind of thing happens with LVC um, and what we go support out there. So a lot of customers out there that we go work with and constantly talk to. We only have a team of about 18 people who do all this. And so it is a workload and it is a mess of scheduling because they still got to go out there and travel to these places to go help them, help them get support. So the LVC, so how do we bring all this? And more and more players are getting on there. Cyber is now in there. Space is now in there. And how we start integrating, because we're not going to do it aggregately like we were talking about before. We're going to need space effects. We're going to need cyber effects. But how we put that together, how we communicate together, how we get that through, and command and control is a big thing. And I know that's been some of the discussion around here today. So the simulator, the LVC, allows us to work these problems out to see how we can communicate, how we can set priorities, how we can command control in those battle spaces. 
And so that's what our constructive IADS allows. Um, and that's what LVC allows. And uh, we're just kind of doing breakthrough type of stuff. One of the big problems we have is cross-domain with the LVC. And uh, I think there are some ways forward that everybody's been May working on with that. Attention? May I have your attention? The alarm that was activated in your area has been determined to be a false alarm. You may return to normal activity. <laughs> All right. May I have your Sounds about right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Definitely. In case you didn't hear it, the other two, huh? All right. So LVC, that's what it gives to you. So a big environment out there, and it's only growing uh, day by day and uh, year by year. Okay. Let me uh, give you a little bit too as I get into this. So bounding this problem, right? Electronic warfare, cyber, big data, all that stuff. There's got to be a way that we look at this problem set and break it down. Otherwise, it's a big elephant, and you can't bite a whole big elephant, right? You've got to bite it one piece at a time. And so how do we do this? And so Warfare Center has been working on this for a while, and we do this through uh, kind of a nomenclature called CDO. So um, contested operations, degraded operations, and operational limits. All right, so the contested is pretty much what the enemy does EM-wise to us. Electromagnetic is everywhere. It is absolutely, it's in space, it's in cyber, it's in the air. So those three domains that the Air Force operates in, EM is in all that. Now how we break that down and get to that, this kind of gives us a way to start there. So the enemy operates in that and degrades us in that. We do it to ourselves in the degraded, right? So if I put something out there and it's on a frequency that I want to talk on or anything like that, we're degrading ourselves. There's sometimes where I got to do brute force on that and just take care of it because if what happens when it's shooting down me, right, I got to get take care of it so it doesn't do that so I can get to the target. So that's the degraded part. Then operational limits. We like rules. Rules keep us safe. Rules allow us to operate. Rules actually give us some maneuvering room, but they restrict us as well. And so we need to learn how to operate in that. And the weather never plays to us right. That's also an operational limit. And so operating in the weather and operating at all costs wherever we need to. Uh, so that's how we break those things down. Okay, so a lot of folks like to think of the, no kidding, equal, not so asymmetric, even though non-kinetic, we consider that asymmetric in some of the talk that we have out there. But if we put it together and just bash skulls together like that, it's not so asymmetric. And so how do we break that down even better? Not to look like this picture here, that we're just meeting equally on the battlefield, but how do we really grab it all together and look at it in those three systems that are three categories that I talked about before and the way those inter intersect together. So instead of this picture here is a way we have talked about it in the past, like six years ago, we like to think of it more like this. And so you got the contested, the degraded, and the operational limits. We are very good, very good at just taking the contested part and going to train to that. Really good at it. We are very good to stop that and go to the degraded part and train to that. We're really good at that. And if we just back on those two and just go fly together with rules and everything like that, kind of like the airlines do, pretty good within their rule limits, we're really good at the operational limits, a part of each other. And we have tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTP, that's the rings around there, that go around each one of those, really good. And it breaks that down pretty well. We call that, back in 19, I think, uh, 76, um, General Jumper wrote a paper on realistic training. And he says, how do we go do the contested or the degraded, actually more the contested, how do we go do that? He called that realistic training. That's never left. We're just kind of making a resurgence and bounding it a little bit differently because we've added so many different things on from 1976, right? the enemy that we go practice against is a lot more sophisticated cyber space. And so we have to build that back and go look at it and the way we have to integrate to overcome that. So it's not the single aircraft, it's more than that. Okay, so that's kind of the way we look at it. But as these things merge together, our TTP break down right in the middle, a lot. 
And so how do we overcome that? And that is where integration has to happen. That's where space has to come in. That's where cyber has to come in. And then where do we put it in a timely fashion that we get the most effect out of it? And so backing up, what kind of effects do we need in that little shady area? What effects? I just want that to be taken out. And then we go down our list of, I can take it out with this, 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 and this. Didn't matter how. Okay, what's our best option to do that? And it doesn't have to be an aircraft. It doesn't have to be cyber. It doesn't have to be you know, space. It can be one of those two. Maybe it's a combination. I'm gonna, one's going to be enabling, and the other one's going to take the rest of the effect down. It's how do we break that down in a logical fashion. And then who's going to command and control all that together, too? And so authorities go into that, play into that a lot. So integration is what it's all about. And that's what we try to focus on. So that uh, electronic warfare integrator reprogramming, we are constantly thinking about that, constantly thinking of the battle space, constantly thinking about how that fifth gen, that data-driven asset, every one of our assets are data-driven now, even in cyber and space as well too, is how do we get that information up to them in a logical fashion? How do we break it down? Because if we just let big data roll, it's not categories. It's not really looked at. What do we flag against? Um, And so that's what we're worried about at the forefront of their electronic warfare squadron. And then how do we analyze and make that battlefield more predictable, right? And so we try to break that down and help those mission planners out. F-35 is probably just the start of getting all that. And then combine that with a cyber effect or combine that with a space effect, and you got some pretty good stuff that's happening out in the battlefield. Um, so just the cusp of what fusion is. Uh, and the F-35, and it is an awesome, awesome, awesome aircraft. And a lot farther ahead than the F-22 was in its development. I will say that. It's been awesome. So the 453rd. So when we break this down for the operational warfighter, I know there's a few patches out here, and I see a few uh, ABUs. So fifth generation development, we got to think of that, because if I can get the fifth generation right, it'll help out the legacy, for sure. Electronic warfare synergy. So... It's in, like I said, it's in cyber, it's in space, it's in the air. So I've got to synergize all those effects around. How do I help get cyber superior, or actually uh, spectrum superiority? Um, what does that look like? I can put that in IMOM and go, hey, this is the bounds of what that is. Because outside that, I might not need to have it, right? I just got to own what I go operate in, give me my maneuverability. So IPOE, that's Intel Preparation of the Operational Environment. PED is Processing, Exploitation, and Dissemination, and somewhere, somewhere an Intel function there, and CPAD is kind of a version of that. We are working for the joint. We definitely get our coalition partners out there. Any type of fight that we go into, we are going to need our partners. We are all resource limited, and the F-35 has been a good way to kind of bound that all together and bring it in because we have a like asset. COCOM planning support, yeah, that's what it's all about. They're the warfighter. They're the ones who leverage. They're the ones who give us the leverage to do what we do. And then EW Tools focused on integration. And that's what the 453 is all about. So I tried to break it down. I think I did it in about a little over a half hour. Um, I could probably answer a few questions. I know I didn't hit cyber too much because we're not a cyber squadron. But EW lives in all that. <laughs> that's for sure. Anything? You got a microphone right there. Okay, let me back up a little bit. (laughs) Thank you, sir. I appreciate your talk. Um, One question, though. You talked about you fed the Army systems and and, uh, mentioned maybe a couple of Navy ones. So my question is, is there a common format for that mission data that is distributed via EWIR, or does it it have to be transposed before it's loaded on all the different platforms? And then the second part of the question is, is there a standardized classification, or does the classification of that mission data vary according to... Uh, the sources it was collected from? So we always try to bust your things down to at least a secret because that is the best way we can uh, communicate across. And really when we're just talking about data, it's just data. It's what you do with it or where it came from that puts those other classifications on it. So data is good. If you combine that together, keep it at the secret side just in case it kind of goes together and we figure everything out. Um, is That's the best way to do that. There are formats there. Uh, so we have an old format and you know, I don't even really know what it's saying. It's called TURF. Um, that goes in a lot of our legacy aircraft, and the new format is SURF. TURF is very um, analytical, line by line. I can take a line out of there and make it good to go. SURF combines all that kind of stuff, and the lines really get gibberish. 
uh, in there, and um, it's hard to break out the categories. And so when we want to share some of that data across with uh, partners and stuff like that, it gets pretty darn hard. And so we're trying to figure that out. It's a way better because I can anchor it to a platform need. Where turf, I can just anchor it to anybody, but it takes a lot of man hours to do that. Um, where surf, not so much of that, and I can just put it in a platform because that's what it accepts. So while there's something that good came out of that, there's a lot of, you know, nothing's ever perfect, so already working on the new version, I think. That's a good question. Uh, anything else? There's been a lot of talk about uh, how our adversaries have been advancing their capabilities and commensurate with that concerns about how as an Air Force we've been focused on the fight we've got today, maybe not paying as much attention to some critical disciplines we had in terms of targeting and the like. And so to the extent that you can share in an open forum, can you kind of sh share your uh, assessment of how we're doing in keeping up with uh, adversary systems developments vis-a-vis -vis your resourcing and, and the kind of right. capabilities we can bring to bear. Right. I, oh, wow, that's a, so I guess this would be kind of in my, I think we're doing a pretty darn good job uh, of it, uh, keeping up. Uh, like I said, the F-35 is awesome. The F-22 is awesome. Some of our cyber capabilities, the SPTs that they're talking about, that are putting, those are awesome things, and we are doing that pretty darn, darn gone good. Our processes are getting a lot better, and so our OODA loop is keeping up pretty fast, especially with those operational limits that we have. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks think, you know, hey, the rules, well, the rules keep us uh, pretty darn uh, organized uh, in a way. So they might be hard to get through, but in the long run, they're good. So I think we're good on that. As far as targeting, and so the command and control of, of that, it just needs to be a target set, right, with effects that I need on there. Instead of, I got a target list for cyber, I got a target list for space, I got a target list for air, I got a target list for subservice, I got a target list for surface, um, depending on what phase we're in and who is holding the um, authorities there, right? So for air, right? And when I, when I say air, that's really airspace and cyber. That's the old arrows that are going over for the first loft, right? That I'm gonna kinda attrit some of what's out there. Is that's gotta, there's gotta be a target set, whoever is gonna throw those arrows out and point them in the right spots has gotta have. And then when we can go actually walk into there or run into that area, there's gonna be another different type of commander who needs a target list to go do that. Some of those will be combined, but there's only, there can only be one commander running the forces, right? Uh, and so what's going to be the predominant one to do that? And so as you do that, um, I think there just needs to be one target set for all that. That's, so I, that's I think there needs to be one target set for all that. Um, that's not speaking for the Air Force. That's just, you know, talking and, hey, how do I go to put effects on there? So if I want target set, I just go, I need these type of effects. Now I can get those effects from all different types of domain, actually all different type of assets. That's one thing is cyber is a domain. I don't ask for cyber, a cyber weapon, whatever that is, right? There's an air weapon, there's a cyber weapon, but it, cyber is not the thing, right? It's something else, uh, but it's cyber is a domain we operate in. I don't know if that, does that answer that? Okay. I got a couple of 453rd uh, field grade officers back here staring at me. <laughs> Anything else? All right, I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. you bet. Oh. Appreciate it. Yeah. But, but my sincere thanks for making time to be here. You bet. So you bet. This, this is the start of, uh, I think, uh, a greater presence you're going to see in future events where we're bringing cyber and ISR and EW together. So, uh, Colonel Brian O'Brien, thanks again. You Appreciate bet. the time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Honored.